Okay, so we have finished with the forward chaining. One problem with forward chaining is the following: that supposing you have a knowledge base K B, and like we often do, we want to pr to prove a certain theorem or a certain statement that we want to ask: is alpha true or not? Is alpha entailed by the K B? But that we can't check. So we instead ask: Is alpha derivable from the KB? So the algorithm that we have seen so far is power chaining. What does power chaining say? If some rule is applicable, then add a consequent to your knowledge base, and your knowledge base keeps growing essentially. So what would happen is that some rule would apply here, some rule would apply here, then some rule would apply here. And in general, the knowledge base would keep expanding. There are two or three problems with that. One is that the plunging factor is very high, essentially. If you are going to blindly keep adding facts, then the, num the number of facts that you will end up adding before you get to this alpha that you are interested in could be quite large and uh, grow exponentially. That is one of the reasons why uh, when we talk about forward chaining again in the context of rule based systems, we will introduce some kind of strategy for saying that of all the rules that you can apply, which one should you choose, but we will come back to that later. One major disadvantage of forward chaining is that the branching factor is very high and Therefore, it is difficult to implement an efficient search algorithm. What we do in backward chaining is that we move from goal to the facts essentially. So, if you if you have this alpha, then there may be two or three different ways in which of which alpha is the consequent. So, we only want to start searching with those two or three possible rules. So, some let us say beta 1 implies alpha, beta 2 implies alpha, beta 3 implies alpha then we would want to check whether okay can we arrive at this alpha using one of those three rules essentially and you can see that because we are focused on a specific goal the branching factor of search here would be smaller essentially there have been people who have said that backward reasoning or goal directed reasoning is the way humans also operate and that's because it's more efficient and that's basically because you know it it is got a small branching factor. If you are doing forward chaining, you know as if you are daydreaming and you know, you know just keep inventing new things, inventing not inventing, adding new facts to your knowledge base and suddenly you find oh I found what I wanted. Backward chaining is more goal directed and can be efficient in many domains. But let us look at the mechanism of backward chaining now. You are given a rule or an implication statement alpha implies gamma and you are given a goal beta essentially. You want to somehow prove that beta is true. When can we use this rule? So, from beta if we can match beta with gamma using one substitution theta or unifier theta, then we can say that if you want to show that beta is true, that beta is the goal, you can move regress to the goal that show that alpha is true or make alpha is the goal, but not just alpha, alpha with the theta substitution applied. Just as we had this substitution playing a role in modified modus exponents, we also have substitution as a role playing in backward chaining. What is theta? Theta is the unifier for gamma and beta. So, as I said here, if you can find this theta, then you can go and infer alpha, but not just alpha, you must infer alpha into theta essentially. So, that is the process of backward chaining. You have, give, you have got a goal, let us say Q of A, you have a rule which says P implies Q, 
you use the substitution x equal to a because that is in the goal and you infer a new goal p of a essentially. So, notice that we are now demarketing the set of facts and the set of goals. Goals is what we want to show to be true, facts are what we know to be true. So, to avoid confusion between facts and goals, we are just marking them with a marker goal here. In practice, you could just keep them in separate files or in separate databases or whatever the case may be, as long as you do not confuse facts with goals. So, what we are saying here is that from the goal q a, if you can find an appropriate rule for which q a will match the right hand side, take the substitution and infer the left hand side of that rule which is p and say that my new goal is p of p. This process has to stop somewhere and this process will stop if the goal that you are trying to prove matches some fact essentially. So, if you so you want to show goal p of a and in your database or knowledge base there is p of a then you are done essentially. You do not have to that is when the the chaining process will stop. Why is it called chaining? Because you are going from one side of the implication statement to the other side. When you are going from the left hand side to the right hand side we call it forward chaining. When you are going from right hand side to the left hand side we call it backward chaining. So, here is a look at this backward chaining process and see that essentially we are doing logically we are doing the same thing essentially making valid inferences. So, this is a backward chaining rule that we just saw that you start with the goal q of a and you end up with the goal p of a and because you find that in your knowledge base you stop the process. Now, just imagine that instead of saying that q of a is a goal, we assume negation of q of a. Okay, so, one bracket seems to have been hidden here. We assume not of q of a. Now, obviously, I hope this rings a bell. That is what we did when we talked about proof by contradiction essentially. Assume the negation of the goal and then go around making your inferences essentially. So, here we are assuming this q of a. So, this fact that it is in a colored box means that it is an assumption, it is not a fact, but it is added as a fact essentially, it is a negation of the goal essentially. Now, our original rule was p of x implies q of x, correct. And we know from the rules of substitution that p of x implies q of x is the same thing as not q of x implies not p of x essentially. That was one of the rules of substitution we had seen. Now, if we start with not q of a and we work with p of x implies not q of x, then we can infer not p of a, which is the rule of modus tollens essentially. So, backward chaining in a way is like doing modus tollens essentially. You can also think of it as doing modus ponens, because if we instead of using the rule p of a p of x implies q of x, we look at the new rule which is here, which is not q of x implies not p of x. Then of course, this q of a will match the antecedent and then we are it is like we are doing modus ponens and we end up with not p of a. So, whichever way we look at it, whether we are thinking of it as forward chaining in modus tollens or uh, backward chaining with modus tollens, uh, we are assuming the negation of the goal which is not of q of a and we are coming to a conclusion that not of p of a. But this is an assumption and we said if you assume that not q of a is true, 
then you can show that not p of a must be true. But that is a contradiction obviously as shown on the left here. So, what is the outcome of the discovering this contradiction is that you have to end up by saying that our assumption was wrong. So, this assuming that q of a is false is wrong. So, q of a must be true and that was the goal that you had in mind essentially. So, logically there is a similarity here. Uh, modus tollens is closer to backward chaining because you are going from q to p, uh, but you could also think of it as modus ponens because you instead of saying that p implies q, you are saying not q implies not p, then it becomes a little bit like forward chaining. The branching factor thing also you must keep in mind that you are only going to work backward from the assumption that you are making not q of a. You are not going to make those forward chaining inferences from the rest of the knowledge base which would make it truly forward chaining. But logically both of them are doing valid inferences is what I wanted to discuss here. So, backward reasoning is goal directed. We only look for rules which the consequent matches in which the consequent matches the goal. The result, this results in low branching factor in the search tree. The number of rules that will come into contention will be smaller and it is in fact the foundation of this whole field of logic programming. Uh, we will come back to that a little bit. We will see a little bit of it when we are looking at backward chaining. We will come back to that later again when we looked at the resolution method and then of course, we will look at the language prologue essentially. So, we will do a quite a bit of that essentially. Now, the interesting thing about backward chaining is that we can do what is called as deductive retrieval. Uh, so, retrieval in the sense of database retrieval that you want to ask a query is there a student who joined in 2020 who has done less than the required number of credits or something, some query and you, you will retrieve answers. Yes, Suresh is this student or Sulekha is this student and so on and so forth. But in database, you can only retrieve what is there in the database essentially. In deductive retrieval, you can also retrieve things which can be inferred from the database. So, that is where logic comes into play and it is quite a powerful mechanism to use essentially. So, when we say retrieval, we mean that the goal need not be a specific proposition. Do not just show that q of a is true. I can ask is there something some q of x which is true. Hmm. So, that makes it a general query you are allowed to make such general queries in deductive retrieval and that is quite an interesting feature. So, you can have variables in your queries and formulas with variables can obviously match facts. So, here is an example. If you want to have a goal, see you do not want to just show that Socrates is mortal you want to ask is there someone who is mortal. So, if you write the goal with a variable which on the surface looks like a universally quantified variable, but it is a goal then it must be treated as existential. So, this question mark inside a goal should be treated as existential essentially. So, when I write this as a goal, I am asking is there a z such that there exists z mortal z is true. So, it is still a query 
about mortality, but it is not a query about Socrates or Aristotle or any such person. It is saying is there someone who is mortal and the way to express that in implicit qualifier form is to use the question mark essentially. Now, if you think a little bit about this, you will see that it will make sense, uh, especially in the context of what we just discussed, with, where we said that uh, uh, a goal can also be thought of as saying that assume the opposite and then do something essentially. So, if I have to produce, if I want to show that there exists z, mortal z, so I will just write z here, m here instead of mortal. If this is my goal, but if I am using this other approach, I am saying let me assume that this is false. What does that mean? Negated goal, not there exists z, mortal z. This is an assumption or you are adding the negative goal and like we did when you saw the tableau method, you add the negation of the goal and then you show that you know this is not possible, there is something wrong, the whole system is inconsistent, there is no model, there is no interpretation that will be true and therefore, you cannot make this assumption. That is a general idea of proof by contradiction. So, if you are going to assume the negation of the goal and it is a goal which is existential in nature that there exists in z m of z or mortal of z or mortal z, then you will add the negation which is you put the negation sign in front of it, but now you remember that you have to be careful with scolomization. So, what you do is you move from there to for all z not m z, which you will scolomize at m not m z, because now by the rules of scholomization that we saw, we have a universal quantifier there and therefore, this whole thing must be quantified as a universal variable. That is one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is that we have a we have different rules for queries and queries and goals are and we have different rules for facts. In facts, question mark comes below a universal statement in a universally quantified variable. Uh, in goals or queries, the question mark comes in existentially quantified variables and that is what we have written here. That if we have a goal which says uh, uh, mortal z, where z is a this thing is basically saying that it is an existential query which says is the statement that there exists a z, mortal z, is this a true statement. But in the implicit form, we will write it as a question mark variable essentially. So, you have to be careful about that. If you are thinking of it as a goal, then you must think of it as an exist that, that you must remember that it is a goal and therefore, it is existential. If you are saying you are going to add the negation of the goal, then it becomes a fact, but that fact will lead to a contradiction and uh, therefore, but it is a universal fact essentially. Then the interesting thing about using variables in goals which is what we are talking about retrieval, which is what we do in databases, is that in addition to answering yes or no, that yes it is true or no it is not true. If it is true, it will also give you a value, which is what you are doing interested in, in retrieval. So, in database you can only retrieve what is there in the database. In deductive retrieval, which is logic programming, uh, you can retrieve things which can be inferred in addition to what are already there essentially. So, it can also return a value and that makes it quite interesting. So, let us look at a couple of examples. So, our good old goal that we are talking about, our goal is, is there someone who is mortal? Remember that this is an existential goal and of course, our rule is there that all men are mortal. So, we do backward uh, chaining here, uh, substitute uh, x with z and we get a new goal that is there someone who is a man essentially. Then of course, this we will find in our knowledge base or database. Yes, Plato is a man. So, you can return that Plato is a mortal 
Yes, Socrates is a man. So, you can return that uh, Socrates is mortal, Aristotle is a man and you can return that Aristotle is mortal. The goal was about mortality, the facts are about being men essentially or human or this thing. But we are able to link the fact that we know that Plato is a man, Socrates is a man, Aristotle is a man. We have the rule that all men are mortal and we are able to link this with the fact that when we said is there someone who is mortal, we could do this logical deduction in the backward chaining form and answer yes to this query, yes this is true, but also give you a name or a value for the variable. Z that yes Z can be Plato or Z can be Socrates or Z can be Aristotle essentially. So, that is an additional advantage you get out of doing backward chaining. You can use existential queries and retrieve answers for those queries essentially. Let us take a break here and uh, we want to look at uh, a few examples of uh, uh, backward chaining uh, and see in what way does the search proceed for that. Okay. So, we will do that in the next 